All right. So this one's kind of out of nowhere. And the truth of the matter is Macintosh loaned me their MX100 Pre-Pro as well as their MC462 almost two years ago. And at that time, I think most of you know, I was going through a divorce, like just rolling right into a divorce. So I was unable to actually review them, test them until April of 2023. It's now, what, November 4th of 2024. And I had reviewed this amplifier, the MC462, again in April. I posted on my website back then, but I still didn't have a setup where I could do videos. <laughs> Since that time, I have honestly forgotten about this amplifier. I sent it back long ago until recently where a friend of mine who owns the 462 had recently purchased an MC275. And he said, hey, man, I know you've got an ABX comparator. I would love to bring these two amplifiers over to your house. We'll level match them. We'll do all that kind of stuff. And we'll listen to them and we'll take notes and we'll see, you know, how how all that sounds, right? I thought... That'd be awesome. Now, I don't have the MC275 anymore, and I didn't do any kind of measurement data on it. It was just kind of an impromptu thing, but it reminded me that I did review the MC462. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and it will be kind of a short review because I don't have a lot of subjective talk about an amplifier. You know, a good solid state amplifier should deliver clean output. It should be, at least in my opinion, low in noise and high in power. This delivers in both of those regards, and it delivers so much power. But let's go ahead and get the elephant out of the room first. Let's just get that sucker evacuated here. This amplifier, I think when it came out, retailed for around $10,000. And, and, and I don't know how long ago it came out, but let's just ballpark it and say five years. Just ballpark it, okay? And you Macintosh enthusiasts can let me know in the comment section below. When I reviewed it, which was about a year and a half ago, the retail on it was $12,000, according to Macintosh. I love Macintosh. Some people hate it. Some people love it. I love it because I have an affinity for nostalgia. And when I was younger, I got to go into a store where they had Macintosh gear. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest stuff ever. And ever since then, I've wanted to own Macintosh gear. In my car audio system, I ran the Macintosh, gosh, what is it? The MC406M, I think it is. It's a six-channel amplifier. Beautiful. I modified it myself. Sucker was awesome. Sold it to a friend. It's been a little while now. But I'll throw up a picture of me holding it when I got it. It was like my little baby unicorn amplifier, except it probably weighed like almost 100 pounds. It's a surfboard amplifier for a car audio system. It was ridiculous. So fast forward to when I got this thing, I was in hog heaven and I really did want to buy it. And I was offered the opportunity to buy it at a review price discount because it was a demo unit. So it had been passed around from person to person. Uh, but even with that demo price discount, there was just no way I could justify it. It delivers so much power. It's so linear. It's so quiet that if you're looking for an amplifier with those characteristics, this one will do it. But if you're looking for something that doesn't cost a boatload of money, then this isn't for you. But if you're like me and you love Macintosh, or maybe you just want to put money into gear that will last you for freaking ever, Macintosh does that. So with that said, when we did our comparison to the MC275, I also tagged it along with my uh, March Audio P501 mono blocks, and it has a Purify Class D module inside of it, super low noise, really high in output power. And as part of my testing, I did some ABX blind testing with me and my friend. I level matched both of the amplifiers, the Purify or the March Audio amplifiers, to the output level of the Macintosh. And I was using the MoFi SourcePoint 888 speakers in my listening session. The thing that I tended to notice was that the power on tap with the Macintosh, again, blind testing, ABX, I had no idea what I was listening to and properly level matched. The power on tap seemed to actually make an audible improvement. And the reason I say that is because in our listening at low volume, 
I could never tell the difference. I had eight tries and I did it through three rounds of testing. i never knew which one was playing. I just, like I would say, this one sounds like, you know, this one is number one and this one is number two. Oh, now I can't tell. Uh, uh, maybe it's number two. Maybe it's number one. I don't know. I did that through 24 tests, three rounds of eight tests each. And it was like, it was basically 50-50. It was just a coin toss as to which one was playing. But when I really got on the volume and we cranked it up to, we were around 95 decibels at about 10 feet away, which is louder than I recommend listening to speakers, at least for any duration. That's when I started to feel like I noticed something different. And my judging sheet, if you will, I would I got about 80% of the time, I guess, correctly. Now, maybe that's within the realm of statistic where that's still not good enough, but it was better than my 60-40 guesswork that I was essentially doing before. 80% of the time, I was guessing that there was an audible difference. Now, I didn't know which one it was until the testing was done, and then I was able to go back and view the results through my ABX switcher, and it will tell me, hey, you were listening to source... A or source B or amplifier A, amplifier B. So with that, I was able to go, oh shoot, okay. The ones where I felt like there was more power, that was the Macintosh. Does that justify the price? $12,000 for the Macintosh versus about 3,000 retail for the pair of the March Audio mono blocks. Does that justify four times the price? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I would, I would say probably not, but again, Macintosh hinges itself on its name, on its reputation, and on its quality of parts, craftsmanship, and longevity. If you're buying a Macintosh, you're probably planning on having it for as long as you possibly can, maybe until you die. And the good thing about Macintosh is it holds its price very well. I mean, I've been a Macintosh fan. I've been looking at AudioGon, eBay, the different forums for the past 15 years. And I always see Macintosh sell for, I would say, within 70% or so of its original retail price in the used market. So it holds its value or it holds its price very well. Now, with that subjective experience aside, I'm not going to get too much more into that. I'm not going to say, oh, the soundstage was more immense or uh, I heard lush detail when somebody hit a tree in the woods on this recording. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like a wave of audio delight just went over me. But in my ABX testing, I was able to correctly tell, if you will, that there was an audible difference at the highest output volume and not so much the lowest output volume. And that difference was just in the ability to deliver output more. It, it sounded less strained less congested. Typically, I would write that off to maybe some sort of multi-tone distortion. The linearity data that I have for this particular amplifier doesn't indicate that there's anything going on with it as far as deviation. No matter what amplifier, or I should say what speaker I hooked up to it, it seemed to be pretty load independent, unlike some class D amplifiers where they might be more load dependent or tube amplifiers. Now, having said that, the March Audio P501 from the little bit of testing that I've done, because my current setup won't allow me to test it at full output, and from the data that I have seen on it, looks to be load independent. So in terms of frequency response, there was really no variability that I was hearing, uh, and certainly nothing that I could say with certainty that, yeah, here's the difference. The other thing that I really like about the Macintosh is no matter the load that you tie into the Macintosh. So let's say you've got a set of speakers that's roughly 8 ohm nominal, and then you've got another set of speakers that's roughly 4 ohm nominal. You're going to get the same power within reason, whereas most other amplifiers without a regulated power supply are typically, typically going to cut the power in half as you decrease the load. So let's say you have 100 watts at 4 ohm, at 8 ohm, you're gonna have roughly 50 watts. Again, that's typically, it's not always the case. I know in the comments, you're gonna just light me up, but typically that's the case. You don't have that with this particular Macintosh amplifier. And for the most part, I don't think any of the other Macintosh amplifiers do that. That's their auto former. So let's look at a picture here that I took. Look at this beauty. So you can turn the lights on or off. 
You can have the meter set to watts or you can have it set to hold. So real watts would just be the meters just cranking away, okay? And if you have it set to hold, it's gonna hold at the peak. The power can be turned on via remote or it can be turned on permanently or just switched off. Now let's flip to the back. On the back, what we see is you have your left and right XLR inputs, you have RCA input, and then you also have RCA output and XLR outputs. You have balanced input mode or unbalanced mode with the switch, and then you have your auto off enabled or disabled, and then you have your triggers in and out as well if you wanna loop those through. On this side, you have your right outputs, on this side, you have your left outputs, and you can see there are different taps. These two taps are your eight ohm load, four ohm load right here in the middle, and then your two ohm load right there. Now let's skip to the data. At the time that I reviewed this amplifier and the MX100, I was borrowing the Audio Precision AP555B or X5, I can't remember the model number, but it was their top of the line Audio Precision unit. I did ask for a quote because I was considering buying it. They quoted me at $42,000 and I said, I'm out. So I sent the demo or the borrowed unit back to them. And it was actually the only piece of gear that I measured with the audio precision. So that's why if you're curious, the data that you're about to see is different from the data that I produce now for electronics. Now, having said that, let's look at the frequency response. Two ohm, four ohm and red ohm, black, blue and red in that order. You can see that from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, there's practically no deviation, maybe a quarter of a decibel or so at two ohm at about 20 kilohertz, you're not gonna hear that. So very good load invariability. What about THD plus noise versus output levels? All right, on the lowest end at about 75 milliwatts, you're looking at about 0.075 THD plus noise. I mean, that's like, and that's already in percentage. So that's super low. As you increase the output and get to one watt, you're down at 0 0.002. So you're actually lowering the distortion. And the reason for that is right here on the low end, you're higher in the noise floor. And as you turn the volume up, essentially, you're getting out of the noise floor and you're getting more into the distortion. So at the extreme end, typically what you're going to find is noise dominated and then distortion dominated. As you ramp the output power up, what we see is we get about 500 watts at eight ohm and at four ohm. And then I'm looking at around maybe 520 watts or so at two ohm right here in black. The amplifier is spec'd at about 450 watts at two, four or eight ohm. So it easily makes power. I mean, just continuous power, it easily makes that. One feature of the Macintosh is its power guard, which if it's enabled, will allow the amplifier to make rated power up to 1% THD, but anything above that, it's gonna basically say no more. It's gonna stop that signal from being output at a higher output volume or distortion ratio. Now, as I said earlier, all this data is on my website, but what I'm gonna show you now is max continuous power and peak power, because it's interesting to know what can this amplifier do in terms of just instantaneous dynamic range or long-term output? In this table, I have a couple different things going on. I've got two ohm results, four ohm results, eight ohm results for max power at 0.01 THD plus N, max power at 1% THD plus N, and then peak power at 1% THD plus N. So what I'm gonna compare for you is, first of all, two ohm at 1% THD continuous power we'll ballpark it and say about maybe 620 watts. At peak power, just instantaneous dynamic range, you've got about 830 watts of power at two ohm. Doing the same thing for four ohm, you've got about 545 watts, but for instantaneous power, about 822, 822 watts, I should say. And then at eight ohm, you've got about 538 watts, and then just about 793 watts for peak instantaneous power. That means that if you want dynamic headroom, you've got plenty of it for this amplifier. Not only do you have an amplifier capable of giving more than 500 watts per channel, regardless of the load that you put on it, but it can also do about 200 to maybe 300 or so more watts in terms of dynamic range. So depending on the power level that you're listening at or the output level that you're already listening at, you're looking at anywhere from about maybe one to two decibels of dynamic range 
that's pretty legit. In the world of cheap amplifiers that are $100, $200 with cheap Class D chip amps, which, listen, I've got no problem with those. I've got a couple here myself, and I use them. The, the go-to reference in the past couple years, for better or worse, has been low signal to noise and distortion, or Synad or Synad, which makes more sense to me. And amplifiers that have really low Synad, maybe, let's say, 100 decibels in Synad, they're propped up. Like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But most of them maybe do 100 watts, maybe. And some of them are very load dependent. So when you're looking at this amplifier, don't forget to factor in that this has really good Synad scores of about 100 decibels at five watts at eight ohm driven load, but it also has the capability to deliver 500 watts or more. It's not a small little amplifier where all the focus is on giving you 50 to 100 watts at a sign at of 100 decibels. It gives you a boatload of output. And still to this day, this is my favorite amplifier. If I had the kind of money where I could afford this or somebody just really felt sorry for me and they thought I should have one of these, Clink, clink. Um, <laughs> obviously, I'm kidding here. Then I would love to have it. Flat out. And I don't have to say that now because I sent this thing back so long ago that I don't even remember. Like, Macintosh doesn't even remember that they sent it to me. So now I'm just now doing the review. But yeah, I mean, end of the day, if you are the kind of person that has the money to buy this and you really want it, but you're like, ah, does it actually do what it's supposed to do in terms of specs? It does every bit of that and more. If you want to hate on expensive amplifiers... Go ahead. I got plenty of cheap amplifier reviews for you to check out. You could do that as well if you'd like to. But yeah, man, these things are just awesome. I think they're super cool. They're way more money than I can afford. But it's nice to be able to test out and review those kind of things occasionally to at least understand what the performance end is, right? Like, where can we go? Now, some stuff that costs a lot of money is just straight garbage. But in this case, that is not true at all. Really what you're paying for here certainly is the performance, but also remember that you're paying for the Macintosh name, of course, but you're also getting incredible build quality and something that you can probably be able to get a good bit of money out of later. Now, I'm not saying you should buy it as an investment. That would be stupid, but it will retain its value reasonably well. With that said, I will talk to you all later. And if you would like to support this channel, you can do so one of two ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner or... You can use any of my affiliate ger generic generic affiliate links in the comment section below. Uh, if you want to go to Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Target, Newegg, Walmart, I just I got all sorts of different ones. And you got to buy something. Just remember, hey, Aaron has an affiliate link. I'm gonna go click on this link and I'm gonna buy whatever I need. That gets me a small commission, no additional cost to you, and it allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I truly do appreciate that. Hope you all enjoy this one. I'll be back with a speaker review soon. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.